I mean, in so as a question about me, it just wants understanding. <laughs> just want to understand these relations between perception, thought, the world, justification. And some of these things absolutely do have application. They, they have application in issues about grasp of concepts, they have applications in developmental psychology, they have applications um, uh, in, in moral philosophy, philosophy. But if, if you ask me, um, are those applications the reasons you do? <laughs> I, I, I just, I want to understand it. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Christopher Peacock. He is Johnsonian Professor of Philosophy and Director of Graduate Studies in Philosophy at Columbia University. And his work has focused on mind, epistemology, and metaphysics, pretty broad topics, but he's, you know, um, his work has spawned, uh, covered a wide range of things. His books include, among others, A Study of Concepts, The Realm of Reason, Truly Understood, the Mirror of the World, Subjects, Consciousness, and Self-Consciousness, and most recently, uh, The Primacy of Metaphysics. He also has a variety of published articles. Feel free to add anything if you'd like, but uh, with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Peacock. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Awesome. So I wanted to start with some questions about, um, or related to that book on uh, the primacy of metaphysics. And um, I read one of the articles I read, uh, though I didn't read the book, was what is involved in the primacy of metaphysics. And you begin that by noting that one of the, or perhaps the central question of the, prim uh, the primacy of metaphysics concerns explanatory priority. Um, and I think you want to explore like specifically um, what is explanatory priority and then apply that to the case of metaphysics and concepts for some domain or um, meanings for some domain and to see which if either is explanatorily prior uh, for that domain. Um, can, you, can you kind of talk more at least briefly about what the dispute is here and maybe what the significance and what's at stake uh, for these views? Okay yeah very good that's a basic basic issue. Um, so I say that uh, one, one thing, um, a, a property or a, um, uh, some individual entity or a relation um, is explanatory prior to a second. Um, if in the account of the nature of the second thing, you have to make reference to features of the metaphysics or nature of the, the first thing. So I'm helping myself here to a lot of notions, the notion of um, what makes something a property or what makes something individual. Um, and uh, I'm interested in the question then just taking for granted the notion of what makes, um, is, it, is it the case that what makes something a certain concept, what makes something a certain way of thinking of an entity or a property, is it the case that um, the nature of that thing, that way of thinking, um, is explanatorily posterior to um, the nature of the metaphysics of the thing? nature of domain. And more generally, I'm interested in the question of whether um, the nature of concepts or ways of thinking things in some particular domain is um, or is not explanatory posterior to the nature of other things in that domain, properties, entities, or whatnot. Now, you can ask this question absolutely in general, as I just did, or you can ask it about some particular problematic interest in domain, about numbers, about subjects of consciousness. Um, and in many cases in philosophy, um, uh, there's some um, salient ontology and there's some salient uh, ways of thinking of things in that ontology where these questions are very pressing. So one classic case I discussed in the book was the nature of the relation between the first person way of thinking and um, subjects of consciousness, subject experience, the things that you think about, uh, that people think about when they think about themselves in the first person way. Um, but the general issue, answering the general question you asked, um, it's almost as fundamental as it can be as a, as a question about how we should conceive of um, 
the relation between our, our concepts and the things we, we think about. And I distinguished um, three, three kinds of position, um, three kinds of general position you could take for any given domain about the relation between concepts of things in that domain on the one hand and the entities themselves in that domain. Um, one view is about a particular domain is um, what I called the metaphysics first view. So the metaphysics first view about a domain is the view that um, the metaphysics of the entities in that domain is explanatorily prior um, to the nature of uh, concepts of uh, things in that domain. Um, that means that you can't give a good account of what it is to be a particular concept um, about things in that domain without talking about the relations of that, that thing to um, that concept to uh, features of the nature of things in that domain, the metaphysical domain. So that's one kind of case. Middle kind of case is uh, no priority view. No priority view says that, yeah, it's, a, it's true that you have to mention the um, nature of things in the domain to explain the nature of the concepts, but the converse is also true. Um, it's also true that uh, you can't explain the nature of things in that domain without um, alluding back to the nature of certain concepts. Things in there. And um, the, classical, the classical view of secondary qualities would be an instance of that, um, that view. Uh, um, uh, I'll come back there later. Um, the, the third kind of view is what I call the, the meaning first view or the concept first view. And that's the view that um, uh, you don't need to mention the metaphysics of domain at all and give an account of the nature of um, concepts of uh, that domain. Uh, it's completely autonomous. You can give a good account of nature of those concepts without talking about the nature of the things or the properties that they refer to at all. Okay, so what, it, what occurred to me um, when I first started thinking about these kind of rather grand issues um, and about 2007, 2008, um, what first occurred to me is that there's a, a general, a very general argument that rules out the, the last of the three views I mentioned. I think that one of, for any given domain, one of the first two views must be correct, either a metaphysics first view or a no priority view. And the general argument um, proceeds from a general claim about the nature of concepts or ways of thinking. And that general claim is the claim that you individuate a concept by specifying the relation in which a thinker must stand to something in order to be thinking of it under that concept. So let me say it again, you, you individuate a concept. What makes a concept the concept it is, is the relation that a thinker must stand in to an entity, individual property, in order to be thinking of it under that concept. So um, for every concept C, there's a corresponding relation R of C. Um, that's it's individuating, individuating concept. And in certain simple cases, uh, it's not, a hard, not hard to say um, what that relation is, at least at first pass, you know, if I perceptually given that pen, um, uh, that way of thinking of the pen, that perceptual demonstrative, um, uh, uh, what individuates that perceptual demonstrative is a certain relation um, and the uh, relation that an object must stand into a thinker in order to think, be thinking of it in that particular way is that it, it's the object that's given as being in a certain distance and direction from the perceiver at that time. Um, given as that, it might not actually be it, you know, it may not be where it seems to be, but it's given as being in that distance and direction. Um, okay, that's that's a claim, um, a very general claim about the nature of sense. It, it generalizes some things that uh, my late friend and colleague Gareth Evans um, talked about um, 40 years ago now. And um, if you think about matters that way, it, it's clear that um, what relations and objects, a big one, let me say again, it's clear that um, what relations an object can stand in um, to a thinker um, depends on the metaphysics of that object. For example, um, uh, own, only objects that are capable of um, standing in causal relations can be perceived objects. And so that, that constrains, um, that constrains the, um, the nature of, uh, demonstrative uh, modes of presentation, perceptual demonstrative modes of presentation. Um, and so generally there's this argument that um, the, the nature of the metaphysics of some domain constrains the relations in which a thinker can stand to things in that domain. Um, that I think rules out the meaning first view, the concept, the concept first views. Um, there are people who hold concept first views in various, in various ways. Um, Michael Dummett held it, um, Chris Bloom Wright's writings commit you to it. Um, it's natural to think of it as a byproduct also of some of Bob Brandon's writings. Um, I mean, on all these views, um, there's some kind of notion of 
of meaning, either given in terms of conceptual role or assertability conditions um, or reason giving relations, which are the fundamental specifications of meaning, and they don't involve fundamentally, um, at least certainly in the case of um, um, Brandom and certain conceptual role theories, don't involve uh, relations of reference. Um, so that that's a kind of master argument, a master argument that um, uh, only one of the first two kinds of views, either metaphysics first or no priority, can, can hold of a given domain. Um, there's then interesting question of um, various particular domains, which, um, which variety of thesis is correct? Why is it correct? Um, and uh, in some cases, of course, it, it's a real challenge to um, say how the metaphysics can be involved in the case of abstract objects where you haven't got um, causal relations at all to the entities. Um, it's, it's a challenging thing to do. But that, that general conception of a, a concept as being individuated by the relation in which a thinker has to stand to something or to be thinking of it under that concept, um, that's a kind of guiding master conception that, that drove my discussion in that, in that book. So what I did was to consider, first of all, the general arguments in the abstract about an arbitrary domain, and then look at various particular cases, look at magnitudes, look at the first person and subject consciousness, look at numbers, look at time and so forth. All uh, classically challenging or interesting, interesting cases. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Um, it's really good as an introduction. Um, I do want to kind of uh, get through a couple of things to um, understand this. So you mentioned at the beginning what you're taking explanatory priority to be. And I kind of, I, I, wrote, I wrote it down from how you put it in the paper, which was that um, the nature of A is explanatorily prior to the nature of B if the following two conditions are met. The correct account of what individuates B, what makes B what it is, what it constitu what's constitutive of B mentions A, whereas um, in addition, uh, criteria two, the correct account of what individuates, individuates A does not mention B. Yeah. Um, um, and we'll come back to this sort of master argument thing, but I, just in thinking about this, my first concern is, and maybe this is something you explore in, in, in more depth, um, what exactly is involved in individuation here? Um, is there, yeah. is this concept something we can develop more precisely or? Yeah, um, um, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, an issue, it's a notion that's, um, especially the notion of the constitutive, what makes something the thing it is, what makes some properties, it's, it's played a huge role in, broadly speaking, analytic metaphysics in the last 25, 30 years. Um, and it's fair to say that I, I take it for granted. Um, your initial opening remarks said I said something about it, but I didn't actually, I just used the notion. Um, I'm, I'm happy to um, uh, say a little bit about it. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a great philosophical task to say more about it. I, I, think, um, I think we have an intuitive grasp on it, um, but certainly, um, the, the idea of what makes something the property it is, um, is something that uh, I think is subject to various, various constraints. I think um, it has to be something that can um, be drawn upon in account of the, the modal possibilities for an object or a property. I think it also has to be something that um, determines the conditions for truth of um, uh, predications of that entity in the actual world, the non-modal things. So if you say that um, a certain object, this pen again, is individuated by um, its kind, a pen, and the time and place at which it's located, that'd be, that'd be a classic Aristotelian stroke Wiggins style view of these things. You individuate by the kind and the time location. Um, then then that, that does determine actually um, what, uh, what it is for an arbitrary thing in the universe to be that particular object um, and determines um, both future and past tense uh, truth conditions um, for predications of that object. Uh, I, I do think the notion of what makes something into it says um, needs further elaboration. Um, I, it's something um, I actually used a lot um, a long time ago, actually when discussing modality. Um, if metaphysical necessity is obviously a a notion for which the um, the question of what a metaphysics first view would be like is 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 pressing and it's interesting and um, I tried to develop um, a long time ago now um, what I call a principle based account of, of what it is for modal propositions to be true. Basically, the idea was that a um, a description represents a genuine possibility if it 
meets a whole lot of, of constraints. The, the constraints have to do with um, you know, uh, if it contains logical constants, the description, then um, uh, it mustn't violate the actual truth tables that uh, individuate those logical operations and so forth. Um, and the core idea there was that um, there's certain things that are constitutive of objects, properties, and concepts, and some things are genuine possibility only if it respects those constraints. And so um, that's another case in which I'm drawing on the notion of the constitutive, helping myself to it. Uh, in that case, and giving an account of um, metaphysical necessity. Um, but I, I do think we have pretty good intuitions about it, what makes um, in each, any particular case. It's sometimes a hard matter to, um, uh, to determine uh, what's constitutive an entity. So the question of what's, what's constitutive of um, a subject of consciousness, either a particular individual or the general property of being subject of consciousness, you know, it's a huge, deep, um, and at most only partially solved um, issue. Um, but it is something that's, um, I take it as being something that's um, objective and not mind or convention dependent. So um, it is one of the great challenges for the people who um, hold the meaning first or the concept first views, um, the, the views that I said are really ruled out by what I call the master argument. Um, it is a challenge to explain what's going on and what seems to be metaphysics. Uh, a person who's discussed this a lot is, is Crispin Wright, and one of the things he says is, that, uh, oh, well, all these metaphysical propositions like um, any conscious mental event must have a subject whose, um, whose conscious state it is. He says these are you know, conventions of language, that metaphysics is just kind of a shadow of various conventions we um, have, principles we accept. Um, and the treatment of the constitutive or the nature of things, of course, needs, needs to argue against that view. And I, I would argue against it for all sorts of reasons. I don't think there's alternative conventions in the offering. I also think that the um, meaning-based explanations of why these metaphysical things are true don't, don't really work. Um, we'd have to look at them case by case to establish that. But, you, but you're right. There's a, a general dependence in this, um, this world of view, if I'm allowed to call it that, that I'm, I'm promoting um, to this it being a, a fundamental and interesting and explanatory notion of the notion of um, what individuates something what's constitutive of it right and one thing you mentioned there but um is something you try to do in being known right with with respect to the necessity and perhaps other things you want to be able to give this sort of um account of it that doesn't make it this mental phenomena or mind dependent phenomena or something like that right absolutely yeah there's one of the um when I was just a baby in this subject, this was something that exercised me a lot thinking about thinking about modality. Yeah, you want you want an account of what it is for the propositions involving metaphysical necessity to be true that just steers a middle course between mind dependence on the one hand and um, really extreme David Lewisian modal realism on the other. I was a great fan, a friend of David Lewis, they mind immensely, but the modal realism, I'm afraid, does get the the blank stare from me and there's a lot more you can say about it just than just giving a blank stare um it, it it does despite what david says it does make epistemology and the theory of understanding quite problematic and giving what i call the the principle based account of modality um steered between those two extremes i think you can um it's epistemically accessible whether um some putative description of possibility meets a certain set of constraints and it's not a mind dependent matter whether it does that it's um there are people who've held um what I would call mind-dependent views of modality. Simon Blackburn tried that out in one of his um, one of his one of his papers. Um, he, I think, would vigorously reject the suggestion that it's a form of mind dependence, but it's it's as mind dependent as his treatment of, of morality as well. I'd say that, um, that a certain kind of response is what makes um, what makes um, certain kinds of propositions true, modal propositions or moral propositions on on the view before. So yeah, I was trying to steer a middle um, position there and. You actually you really put your finger on something there, connecting this more recent work on the primacy of metaphysics with that much earlier work um, on the what I call the integration challenge, the challenge of integrating metaphysics and epistemology domain. One of the things that didn't strike me when I was writing Being Known, and you know, looking back, it's kind of idiotic not to have been struck by it at the time, is that in every case in which I tried to give um, an account of the metaphysics of domain and corresponding theory of understanding that integrated them, that made the metaphysics and epistemology 
not problematic, mutually problematic. In every single case, they're actually, they're all metaphysics first <laughs> treatments. Um, and you know, it should have occurred to me at the time to think, you know, if, if this is actually true, maybe there's some explanation of why it's true, why it's never a meaning first view that's correct. Um, but takes time, takes time. Yeah, yes, sir. There's some. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I did actually have, um, I was going to ask effectively, that, effectively this sort of question, right? Because you, a lot of that in being known is was you're looking at the integration challenge, you say, um, providing for some domain, an acceptable epistemology and metaphysics for that domain. But um, yeah, I was, you sort of talked about this already, but I was wondering what, um, in what ways your approach there has like changed or maybe stayed the same um, since writing that book? Oh, you mean since writing being known? Or? Being known, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, my views probably have not on the topics discussed there. I, I hope, I hope the thought on the first person has deepened just a little. Um, anybody who thinks they've reached the final truth about the first person, <laughs> just, just look at look at the historical induction, and uh, we we understand the first person much better now than we did um, uh, even even twenty years ago. Um, uh, um, yeah, I think um, I, I hope that everything in the primacy of metaphysics is, is consistent with the views of, of being known. I, I regard it as really a, a later development of the of the same the same project. Um, uh, one way of looking at these things, and I'm glad you raised this question. Raised this question. One way of looking at the this is that in being known, I was concerned with how you could meet the integration challenge in various different domains. Um, but I wasn't really concerned there with the explanatory project of um, constraints on how they, those, um, um, how the dovetailing had to be, how it had to be, whether, um, whether there were general uh, principles you could appeal to that would explain why there are certain constraints were subject to in giving the reconciliation and meeting the integration challenge in various domains. So you can see those those two books go together in a, in a certain a certain way, and um, who knows whether or not there's lots of mistakes in primacy metaphysics. But the the aim there would be to be more explanatory um, of uh, constraints that are de facto respected in the in the earlier book. That's a good issue to raise. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so it's just like a, a a follow up in a way, sort of. You're you're expanding on it. Um, giving more of an account of certain things, and including, as you say, um, recognizing certain facts about, well, metaphysics first is like the, the right uh, approach here, even if it's not made explicit in your in the, in the earlier work. Yeah, I mean, it's not, as I said earlier, the general argument, that so-called master argument, doesn't rule out no priority cases. It, it ruled out only a third kind of case. But in fact, all the examples I did treat in the in the earlier book, yeah, were metaphysics first cases. Yeah. Um, so the later arguments don't rule out the no priority cases. But um, I didn't even raise the question um, twenty two years ago, twenty three years ago, of um, the form of the solution in any, in the area. And the, well, the form was: is it metaphysics first? Is it, is it not? Is it something else? Yeah. Um, so need, one needs to step back, I think. Uh, um, yeah to ask those questions, yeah. Right, and you, um, so you introduce what you call the, the primary thesis um, and you describe it as follows, right? The metaphysics of a domain is involved in the philosophical explanation of the nature of the meanings of sentences about that domain and the metaphysics of a domain is involved in the philosophical explanation of the nature of the intentional contents, ways of representing uh, concerning that domain. Um, am I, is it right to say that, uh, um, and maybe this is similar to the master argument, but, but I, that this is ruling out the meaning first views because for some domain, um, the nature of the meanings of sentences of that domain is itself a metaphysical concern. Um, and so you can't start with that to um, be prior to the metaphysics of that domain. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. The primary thesis rules out the, the third of the three cases I, I distinguished at the start of this, this chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I, I, was, I was wondering if, what if someone were to try to maintain that um, 
understanding the meanings of the sentences used to talk about some domain does not itself require understanding or explaining the nature of the meanings um, or of sentences used to talk about that domain. And so while the latter would require a certain metaphysical knowledge or understanding, maybe the former wouldn't. And in that sense, the semantics might be prior. Do you kind of understand what I'm getting yeah, at? Yeah, no, I do. I do. Um, I think I got the question. You can correct me if I haven't, if I don't seem to be answering it. Um, I distinguish, I've distinguished very sharply between um, grasping a concept and having a philosophical theory of what it is to grasp a concept. So um, uh, you don't have to be any kind of sophisticated philosopher, indeed a two-year-old child, to think that pen, that pen is mine, that pen writes for it. Um, you can ask what relation the thinker has to stand in, uh, even the two-year-old, to be thinking of it as that pen, and then we will give a philosophical account of um, it's the pen that's presented in this, uh, has to be the thing that's presented in a certain uh, distance and direction egocentrically from the, from the subject. But of course, you've got to distinguish between standing in the relation and theorizing about the relation. All you need to do to grasp the meaning is to stand in the relevant relation. It's then a philosophical matter to reflect on what relation you have to stand in to have the concept. So I'd always distinguish very sharply between standing in the relation and formulating what the relation is. Formulating what the relation is, is a uh, Philosophical enterprise may be very hard, may be easy, but it's always different from simply standing in standing in the relation. Yeah. Right, and so because we need this understanding of what it means to stand in the relation, or what the sort of relation consists in, and stuff like that, because that's a metaphysical concern. Um, uh, well, well, then we ask. Yeah, how would you put it? Yeah, let me say a bit about it. So. Um, that's the, the first step in formulating a theory is if you accept that concepts are individuated by relations in which you have to stand to something or to think about that concept. The first step then is, is to formulate what the relation is. Um, that itself is a really non-trivial exercise in some cases. And in, in the case of thought about the natural numbers, in the case of first person thought, you know, this is, um, this is sometimes hard stuff. Um, but then once you've got an account of the relation, then there's then the question of what's its philosophical significance, um, as it, uh, and um, also once you have some general account of the form of the relation, that it's a certain kind of relation to an entity, then does the metaphysics of the entity then constrain what relations the thing can stand in? And then that's the springboard into the various theses I put forward about it. So there's various stages there, um, various steps, various gradations. There's there's simply possessing the concept and you don't have to have much, any philosophical theory just to possess the concept. You just have to stand in the corresponding relations. The next step um, was the is that to formulate the relation. Next step is to see whether there's some kind of generalization you can make about this relation across lots of different domains. And then the next step is to, beyond that, um, is to uh, then see if there are constraints on the nature of the entities that constrain the relations in which the thinker can stand in. Um, and some of those constraints will come from the metaphysics of the domain. Um, so nobody, I shouldn't say that, it's always wrong to say nobody thinks in philosophy. <laughs> For every proposition you can formulate, there's somebody in philosophy thinks it. Okay, I won't say that. Um, anyway, it's extremely implausible that the natural numbers stand in causal relations uh, to thinkers. And so the account of what, what relation it is to think has to stand in to the natural number zero in order to be thinking of it as zero will be extremely different from the perceptual demonstrative case. It's uncontentious and should be uncontentious that it's the metaphysics of the entities that's um, uh, constraining um, the relations you can you can stand in. Yeah. So, but but in a nutshell, the crucial thing is to distinguish um, the uh, the concept from a theory of the concept. I mean, even in the most um, so in some cases there are some cases where a concept certainly like indexical concepts like now, it is not hard to um, specify the relation in which you the thinker has to stand at a given time. You ought to be thinking at that time of something as now. It simply has to be the time in which they think of it. Um, but in other cases, um, it is extremely hard. And you know, you could you could write many books on the relation in which a thinker has to stand to an entity in order to be thinking of it in the first person way. And that um, books have been written on that very topic. So it's theorizing about the relation, standing in the relation is one thing, theorizing about it's another, and the theorizing can come at various levels. Um, simply, first of all, formulating the relation and then reflecting on that relation 
and its significance for um, the theory of content, for epistemology, or whatever. I think I think I I think I understand it better now. So it's like um, when we say that the 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 concepts are not um, explanatory pro explanatorily prior to the metaphysics is because when I'm talking about the concepts, I'm not just talking about you know um, you know standing in the particular relation or or even just possessing the concept. I'm talking about the nature of the concept. Right, and because the nature of the concept involves its um, certain individuation criteria and like relations and so forth, and the nature of those things is going to be a very metaphysical question, um, even if you know possessing the concept doesn't require, you know, understanding those metaphysical in, uh, issues. Yes, is that the idea? that's that's yes, that's right. It's specifically the metaphysics of the entities in which you stand in the relation um, will constrain the relations you can stand in. Let me make one. Um, Another remark that may, may be relevant to help people. I, um, I also think of this um, relational individuation of, of concepts or ways of thinking. I, the idea that for every concept, there's a corresponding relation that individuates it, the relation which I think has to stand to something or to be thinking of it under that concept. Um, I think of this as I hope making um, some of what Frege said about the third realm of senses more palatable. So. Frege you know, said there was this, there was this third realm of thought with a capital D, Gedanke with a capital G, um, that exists in this proud isolation from the mental world and the physical world. The third realm actually, he actually said Dritter Reich, but we, we don't talk about that. <laughs> it's very unfortunate. Um, but um, he said almost nothing. I, Frege scholars could correct me. I'm trying to say he said absolutely nothing. Um, anyway, virtually nothing about what it was to grasp these, these, these thoughts. He said you could judge them, you could reject them. He said standing in relations to them can affect events. And all, but he didn't, he didn't say what, how on earth you could stand um, in relations to these, these proud abstract objects in the third realm. I think the relational conception of, um, of concepts um, can alleviate that worry to, to some extent. Um, this, it, on the, it, it's, in fact, they're actually individuated, the concepts are individuated um, on this account by what it is to grasp them, what it is to stand in a certain relation. What, um, so the um, thinking of them, things under a certain relation, the subjects thinking of something under a certain concept um, is actually prior to the individuation of, of the concept itself. You can think of the, the concepts or the senses as abstracted from these relations. There's nothing more to it than the relation which you have to stand in to be thinking of something that way. Um, so I, I, I'm not somebody who's an eliminativist about senses or concepts. Um, and I think they have to earn their explanatory keep. But I do think the, the pure Fregian conception, these entities stand in this um, proud isolation, completely independent of what is to grasp them. That's something that's rejected on this, this conception of concepts or sense. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've always been, um, or, for a long time been sort of sympathetic to um well more nominalist views but if i don't if there's some room uh, necessary or explanatory benefit for positing abstract objects or even a third realm of objects then you know maybe that's maybe, maybe we should but um I, I how would you respond to um like frege's argument for thinking that there have to be um these objects in a third realm because of you know there's common contents of common contents uh, yes the law yeah. of inertia that's judged and disputed and formulated and passed down right. for generations and so forth yeah and these famous phrases um and you know it's uh you know, sometimes when you read Frege, it's as if these tablets have been handed down a message from the lord i mean that's, you could write you can write that way only if you're Frege. um uh the idea that two thinkers can be judging the same content is is non-negotiable. I think I think he's right about that, but he's he's wrong to think that the only way to do that is by an account of the third realm, um, on which it it doesn't matter whether you say what it is for the thinkers to grasp them. I think that isn't right. So I think you need to constrain um, the third realm by saying that the each sense is individuated by the relation which a thinker has to stand to something, nor to be thinking under that sense. Now that's not yet to legitimize the ontology. I think it's. Um, it may make it a bit more palatable, but I think it's got to earn its keep. And I think for every ontology of this kind, um, you uh, 
um, you've got to say what legitimizes it. Um, and it won't necessarily be the same answer in the case of each kind of um, abstract entity. Um, but I'm sure it won't. Uh, so um, yeah, there's, there's still work to be done, but I think um, it's, not, it's not work that's intrinsically impossible in the way it is if you have <laughs> Frege's conception. Of the Although he said that standing in these relations to different thoughts, you know, can move matter because people judge things and affects their actions. Um, I mean, it's true they do, but he hasn't, he hasn't said how it's possible. He's given a theory under which it's really a mystery how it could ever be possible. Um, so you have to start out with a, an account that doesn't make it impossible. Then you've got a lot more to say. A lot more has to be said about the explanatory significance of attributing mental states with, with senses or modes of presentation or guises, or whatever I can favor in them. So that, and that's, uh, I acknowledge that debt, that, that, that that's a task that needs to be that needs to be done yeah 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 that's very fair and, and sort of on a somewhat related note you, you've mentioned already um the sort of difficulties in in applying this account to the case of numbers and perhaps other abstract or purportedly abstract objects um universals properties propositions who knows um how would you do you, do you try to make some progress on that or, or where where do you come to Yes, uh, well, let me say something about that. So, um, I, as I said in the preface, um, I, it took me more than 10 years to write the primacy of metaphysics the book. I, the ideas first occurred to me in 2007, 2008. Um, and I had this general abstract argument for the metaphysics first view, um, uh, sorry, for the uh, metaphysics involvement view, for the primary thesis. Um, uh, and then there's the question, yeah, for how a domain that's relatively well understood, like the, the natural numbers, um, how, how does uh, this, the primary thesis apply to that area? And um, I, came, I came to the realization, if it's correct, eh, that it's not only causal theories that can, can sustain the, the primary thesis. Um, so I, I came to the idea that you should have a, a, a two-stage account of um, concepts of natural numbers. And uh, the first stage is the conception of each natural number as being individuated by what I call its application conditions. Each natural number is individuated by the condition for it to be the number of Fs. So what, what makes something the natural number it is, is the condition for it to be the number of Fs for arbitrary F. So what makes something the natural number zero? Not ways of thinking, they're just the entity itself. What makes something the natural number zero? is that it's the unique natural number n such that for there to be n f's is for it to be the case that there's nothing that's f, not the case that exists x such that f x. Um, and so we reach that, each of the other natural numbers. The second stage in this, in this conception um, is one which um, I called individuation precedes representation. So the idea is that in this particular, this very special case, um, grasp uh, of a concept, grasp, for example, of the concept zero, uh, thinking of a certain natural number as zero. Um, to grasp that concept is to have some tacit knowledge of that individuating condition. You have tacit knowledge that what it is um, for there, um, a natural number to be zero is for um, it to be the unique thing that's um, such that uh, for it to be number of Fs is for nothing that's F. Um, and that tacit knowledge um, guides your application, explains your application of um, natural numbers. So if you start thinking that way, um, you, you're combining the individuation of natural numbers by their application conditions with this, this principle of um, individuation precedes representation. So in this special case, it's a very special case, there's actually, I would like to say, some tacit knowledge of the, of the metaphysics, because that's actually what individuates the natural number zero, that condition um, for it to be the um, number of Fs. Um, in other cases, I don't think that's true. I, um, uh, the relation, the causal relation you have to the material uh, universe um, that's involved in perceptual ways of thinking of objects and properties um, doesn't involve any kind of tacit knowledge of the metaphysics of material objects or material properties or shape properties. Um, one of the interesting questions is whether this, this treatment of um, numbers, um, I treated natural numbers this way, I suggested that there's a somewhat analogous treatment of, of the real numbers, conceiving real numbers as um, ratios and magnitudes as a classical 
19th century journal conception. One of the big questions, one of the things I'm, I'm working on now, although I, I left out this massive topic in, in the book, is, is whether the same model can be applied to um, the grasp of moral properties. Moral properties. Um, it's extremely tempting, and I, I, I think there'll be ways of doing it. The idea would be that you, there's first of all a metaphysical account of what individuates um, property being a good action or right action or whatnot. Um, and then uh, the kind of grasp of moral goodness, you have some kind of tacit knowledge of that individuating can. And the attractions of that is that again, it steers between um, mind dependence of moral claims on the one hand, and an inaccessible, inaccessible realm um, that you can't access, and the kind of thing that John Mackey criticized on the other. Um, so just as in the case of uh, metaphysical necessity, there's a, a, a middle way, I think, um, between the mind dependent accounts and um, those that postulate a kind of reality that in the nature of the case you couldn't you couldn't access. Um, uh, so I, I hope to do I hope to do more on that uh, very soon. But stuff is hard. <laughs> One step at a time on this stuff. Thank you. Yeah. I'd have to think more about that in the case of of, of natural numbers, but um, it's not it seems gonna be difficult not just thinking about real numbers, but I mean, complex numbers, shapes, other um, higher level mathematical entities. Um, is that going to require a different treatment or what do you think? Yes, I, yeah, absolutely. I think you, you're completely right. Um, so the, the natural numbers and the real numbers are very, very special cases. Natural numbers, they are individuated by these application conditions. Uh, the conceiving of real numbers as ratios of magnitude that has enormous attractions in all sorts of ways. Um, um, but neither of those conceptions is right for the ontology you need for any part of higher mathematics beyond, <laughs> beyond the high school. Um, so my view, um, my view is this, uh, in the very special case of natural numbers and certain things that are definable in terms of Apparatus of natural numbers, very basic set theory, and with complex numbers, you can get you can get that way. Um, but any anything more sophisticated, I, I do think that something like um, uh, Carnap's conception in um, empiricism, semantics, and ontology is is right. It, it it's okay to to introduce an ontology as one that conforms to certain principles, as long as those principles are are consistent. Um, I think it's very important that that model does does not work for um, does not work for natural numbers. It's important that it doesn't work for um, the real numbers. But I do think there are certain cases in which it it is applicable. Yeah. Um, one of the questions always, I think, in these areas, it's very helpful to ask is um, what's the general nature of the relation in which you have to stand to something in order to be thinking of it. And that in the case of natural numbers, con connection with application and numerical quantification is completely non-negotiable. Nobody, nobody has grasped the concept of zero if they, it comes as news to them that there's zero Fs in them, yeah, there's um, nothing that's F. Um, and in the case of, of real numbers, um, yeah, the conception, the conception of real numbers as ratios of magnitude is really the only thing that can properly explain why the Pythagoreans were so shocked to discover that that root two is irrational, um, because you, you can't deny that there's a ratio of those two magnitudes. Um, there, there, um, there, there is a ratio, and indeed, it's a geometrical magnitude. And, um, uh, uh, the ratio is a ratio that's represented by a geometrical magnitude, and um, otherwise wouldn't be present. But in the case of um, things like um, you know, a, a lie group or um, all kinds of entities that you want, there it's extremely plausible that you can think of um, something meeting that condition, um, uh, only if you've got some grasp of the axioms that, uh, um, that it's supposed to be subject to. And that there is much more plausible. If somebody came along and said, look, um, uh, you grasp the concept of natural number only if you've got some tacit grasp of the, of the piano axioms, I, I would extremely strongly resist that. Um, the piano axioms are things that you dis can discover. Um, so take principle of, um, complete induction on natural numbers. Um, you already grasp what it is to be a natural number, you already um, use these things, and then it comes as interesting information, really striking. And this, not only um, uh, the natural numbers conform to this, but there's, you know, a, there's a reason they do. You know, 
Uh, so, but you wouldn't say that about having the concept of a lie group or a Boolean algebra or whatnot. You say, look, you, you haven't really got the concept unless you realize it conforms to these basic axioms. Um, similarly for the real numbers. I mean, if you, you know, take things about limits of a seriousness, there are lots of um, really interesting uh, principles that, uh, that they conform to. There's a, there's a genuine discovery as to people already had the concept. Um, whereas in the case where the Carnot model is correct, um, it seems it seems that this constitutive a grasp of the notion that you have some kind of appreciation that it corresponds to these axioms and, um, uh, for for proper understanding. I mean, there's always the question of deference, and yes, you can hear somebody talking about a Boolean algebra and not know what it is. But um, if you really understand the notion, then you've got to grasp the axioms. Whereas that that's not true, I think, of the um, the natural numbers or the real numbers. So there's cases and cases there. Yeah. Right, and so would you say that not not only do the um, sort of requirements for possessing the concept vary between these different mathematical notions, but maybe their metaphysics and ontology might vary as well, like um, yes. metaphysics for, yeah. Yes, no, absolutely. So I said that the natural number zero was individuated by the condition for there being zero Fs. Um, and uh, for each real number, it's individuated um, by the condition for it to be the ratio of, of certain magnitudes. Um, but yeah, if you ask what, what makes something um, a Boolean algebra, whatnot, then you would talk about the axioms that have to be satisfied. And, and, that, and that's a very different model for understanding. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. I just have to think about that, that some more. Is that something you're going to um, try to explore more in some of your later work and upcoming work? Or There's, a, there's quite a bit about in the chapter on numbers, actually, in um, in the primacy of metaphysics book, um, but it, it, but you're quite right. Uh, it, it, that points in various directions from where that chapter ends. Um, uh, so yeah, there, there's more th more that could be done with that, those distinctions if they're right. Um, yeah. Um, I had a question from someone who was wondering. Um, of course, I mentioned in the introduction that you had it. A long time ago now I wrote in this book a study of concepts I guess that's like almost 30 years ago now something like that I and um, <laughs> um how would you your what kind of is the the notion of of the concept you have in that is, do you think that's changed in your uh, in your work since then um yes uh, I mean of course it's I still claim to be talking about um, sense and ways of thinking, but almost the moment I corrected the proofs and sent off a study of concepts, um, the publisher, because you know you identify with something, maybe when you send it off to the publisher, you see this thing float off into the sea of discussion. You don't feel identified with it uh, so strongly. I, I wonder if that was just me, but I'm talking to other friends written books, they feel exactly the same way. You can take a certain distance, etc. Almost immediately I've sent off. Um, I began to realize that a much more rationalist position was needed in the case, particularly of logical constants. So even in the case of um, and introduction and elimination, um, I had the, uh, the Leibnizian thought that it's your understanding of and that makes you appreciate those are correct. Um, it, they shouldn't be written in as, as primitively compelling. They are compelling, but uh, when somebody understands conjunction, it's a, as a result of their understanding, they appreciate those laws are correct. And there are other cases too, where it was extremely implausible that you had to grasp, already grasp the laws um, or logical principles um, to be counted as understanding logical constants. Double negation is a very clear case of that. When we teach 18 year olds, Baby logic in universities. They've understood negation um, uh, since they were little kids, but um, it comes as new. Sorry, oh yeah, double negation is correct. Double negation of the nation is correct. That's they draw on the basis of their understanding of negation to um, appreciate that that's correct. One of the things that had a huge impact on me just after writing that book was um, the the articles in uh, volume three of Gödel's collected papers. Um, there's this paper that uh, never got published in the Carnap volume. Gödel went through successive drafts of it. Um, and 
one thing he just insists on again and again against Carnap um, is that uh, there's such a thing as understanding expression and on the basis of that understanding, thereby coming to appreciate a certain principle is correct. Now in Gödel, of course, that's sometimes connected with extreme forms of Platonism and connected with Rambi abstractions. But the basic phenomenon is, is a much more moderate rationalistic one, is that there's such a thing as understanding, which can be the basis of your coming to appreciate that the law is correct. So that, that's one, um, that's something that uh, had a big impact on me. When I wrote some stuff on implicit conceptions that's in, um, uh, in, the, um, in the 2008 book, um, Truly Understood, uh, the implicit conceptions, those were implicit conceptions that um, uh, explained your ability to appreciate certain law is correct for um, some concept you already possessed. So that that, uh, that had a big impact on me. Um, and it made also, um, I think it opened the door to tacit knowledge playing a much bigger role in the account of understanding and grasp than was given in, in the study of concepts. One way of looking at the study of concepts is that it's, um, um, it's simply a marriage of two approaches. It's fundamentally a conceptual role account with certain referential constraints imposed on the conceptual roles. And I came to think that that was too weak. I, I certainly, at the point that there are constraints from the level of reference on legitimate concepts, that's, that's important. I mean, that's, you know, it already rules out all kinds of um, you know, alleged, logical, alleged connectives which you can't give a truth table and things like that. Um, but it's, I think it just, it greatly understated the, the role of reference um, in uh, the individuation of concepts. You can't say, well, here's a conceptual role specified independently of reference. And now it's only if it's a conceptual role that meets certain other constraints that it's a good one. Um, and in fact, the very idea in the later work of a, a concept as being individuated by the relation in which you have to stand to something or to be thinking of it under that concept, um, that brings in the, um, the referential relations absolutely into the individuation of the concept itself. And you might say, well, Chris, you should have noticed that earlier because it was all available as it was. And it, indeed, if you're going to um, respect the Fregean constraints, um, the, the thing that Dummett talks about all the time, um, quite rightly, I think, and it's absolutely there in Frege that that a sense is individuated by the condition for being the reference. That, um, um, that's respected by the relational conception of sense in a way it isn't really properly fully respected, I think, by the stuff in a, in a study of concepts. Um, so yeah, I should have seen this earlier, but you know. <laughs> yeah, so another, uh, let's see. Yeah, so I think in, in primacy of metaphysics, one thing you do talk about is sort of the boundedness of the conceptual. Um, yes. You, you kind of use um, sort of some of the conclusions you draw here to um, show, well, maybe the conceptual kind of is, has these various limitations and so forth. Can you, can you talk about that briefly and what some of those limitations might look like? Yeah, yes. I um, In McDowell, you get the idea, um, not just that the world can make rational certain judgments, which I think is in itself correct, but should be uncontroversial, um, but to get the much stronger view um, that um, what, explain, what can explain um, somebody's judgment on a particular occasion is a a thought at the level of sense being true. It's because this thought holds in the world that you judge to be the case. Um, and so on McDowell's view, when I judge um, that, that, pen is, that pen is black, um, uh, what's explanatory of my judgment? I get my, my mind um, extends into the world and um, uh, what explains my judgment um, is actually the thought itself being true. Now, I don't think that's correct. It may be a loose way of speaking, but what I, I think that um, modes of presentation of objects, modes of presentation of properties um, are never involved in the explanation of states of affairs of, of the perception. What, what's explaining, what explains your perception of the, um, 
of the objects having a certain shape, let's say, is, is that objects having a certain shape property? Okay, that's, I mean, this respect, this is something which I agree with um, Anscombe. Anscombe, you may remember, got into an argument with, with Davidson. And Anscombe insisted, and I think absolutely correctly, um, that um, what explains various events are objects having various properties. Um, it's not the case that it's an object under a certain mode of presentation explaining certain things. Um, if you want to put it in terms of facts, it's um, the first term of the ex causally explains relation is, is a fact rather than a, something at the level of thought or sense. So let's go back to um, McDowell's claim, which is certainly not something you should disagree with, that the world can make rational certain kinds of judgments. The sense in which I think that is true is that an object having a certain property um, can make rational um, a judgment about that object under a certain meditation, having a certain property in that mode of presentation. And of course, you have to explain why it is certain properties of the object make one judgment rather than another rational. So going right back to a study of concepts, I distinguish between judging something square, judging its regular diamond shaped, even though these are exactly the same shape. And so of course, you'd have to talk about in, a, in more detail um, about how it's certain symmetries of the object that make you perceive the thing as diamond shaped rather than rather than square, but um, on the on the question of um, the world making rational certain judgments, I think it's it's the facts at the level of objects, properties, and relations um, that causally explain and make rational certain um, certain judgments. Uh, so. You could ask then, you know, how much am I really disagreeing with McDowell here and how much not? Um, this is certain, the view I'm putting forward um, is certainly not an internalist view about concepts. I, I'm not an internalist about concepts at all. Um, I disagree with um, uh, Dave Chalmers and um, some of his supporters and some of the people who originated Dave's views. Um, I think in the case of um, the spatial content of perception, for example, you can't give a good account of what is an experience to have a certain kind of um, a rich spatial content without talking about all kinds of environmental relations. Um, so I'm not an internist about this. It's not something that, um, that pulls, um, pulls the mind into <laughs> an inner boundary to which McDowell would object. Um, so uh, the combination I want here is one in which um, I want to say it's okay to say that the world itself sometimes makes certain um, judgments rational. Um, the respect in which that's true, I think, is that objects having certain properties are standing in certain relations um, can be uh, facts that are perceived, have a causal influence on the subject, and they can make the thinker's judgments rational. Um, I don't think that needs to entail that it's, it's, it's a thought, something with a level of sense that enters the explanation, enters causal explanation. I think Hanscom is is right about that. But I don't want to draw the conclusions from that at all that um, we should have it some kind of internalist account of um, senses or ways of ways of thinking. It's not my not my view at all. And in fact, I think if you well, as, as soon as you start to formulate um, the idea that senses or concepts are individuated in terms of the relations which you think has to stand to something or to think of that concept, these, these relations will be all kinds of external ones in the case of um, shape concepts, temporal concepts and the rest. Uh, so um, I'm not, not, not an internalist in that sense and the relational conception would militate against the, uh, the internalist view of those notions. Yeah, fair enough. And, uh, um... Did have another question related to uh, the stuff about numbers, and um, mm -hmm. so like Paul Benasraf had this this kind of famously had this um, pessimistic yeah. view about um, yep. sort of the relationship between our mathematical ontology and and mathematical knowledge. Um, he thought maybe you couldn't have a clear account of both. You know, um, maybe you'd have a clear account of the knowledge, uh, the sort of knowledge but not a clear account of the ontology or vice versa and um uh so does your how does your application individualationism about numbers delivers sort of resolve this problem if it is a problem about integrating the metaphysics and epistemology of of the uh, of this domain of, of numbers 
Well, I hope it does that. Um, <laughs> so I want to. I would want to say that uh, that um, the poor Bonasteraf missed an option. He was. Um, and he's quite rightly said, you know, there's no reason for identifying with one, you know, with the Zamelo numbers as opposed to the Nomen numbers, of going Nomen sets, and so forth. That's all. That's all true. Um, but I think it's an option also that that Frege missed. So when Frege said, um, Frege considers at one point in in the Grundlagen, he considers, um, well, perhaps you can define the, and then he's actually talking about defining expressions, define um, symbol zero um, as, um, you know. And then it gives a contextual definition. There's zero f's just in case it's not the case. There's something that's f. And then, and then he makes the famous Julius Caesar objection that these stipulations don't determine whether number zero is Julius Caesar. Um, we have to distinguish sharply between defining expression and individuating an entity. And I think if you speak of individuating um, the natural number zero in terms of the condition for it to be the number of f's, if that's a legitimate thing to do, um, then the Bedassar problem is solved because the way you can know things about those natural numbers is by working out whether they're consequences of the individuation condition. Um, um, so, uh, you know, um, what's five plus zero? I'll be five again because there'd be numerical quantification conditions associated with each, each of these things. Um, similarly, you would define, you can define um, addition and multiplication and the rest um, in terms of operations on the numerical quantifiers in such a way that you generate ways of coming to know arithmetical propositions. So um, I, I think it's, um, I think I said in reply, it feels insubordinate to say that both Frege and Vanessa missed an option there, but it, it does seem to be an option. It certainly didn't actually consider it anyway. So if, if we speak here in terms of individuating the entity in terms of the application conditions, yeah, we do get um, uh, an account both of understanding, because understanding can consist in tacit knowledge of the individuation conditions, and we have a way of integrating the epistemology of metaphysics because it's individuated by the application conditions. And how does that help with epistemology? Well, because you can learn about those entities and the relations which they stand by looking at the application conditions and working out things, things from, um, from them. So, so yeah, I would I would want to say it. Um, uh, there's a lot of hostages to fortune there. Um, uh, this, um, when I say you individuate the natural number zero by the condition for there being um, zero Fs, uh, of course, I'm quantifying over the number twice there. I say it's the unique natural number N such that for there to be that number. So um, there's a question about whether this is a legitimate form. You know, does it, in other cases, does it lead to trouble? I mean, this, this case seems to be okay. It doesn't really seem problematic, but there's lots of background question issues to be addressed, but nonetheless, I do think it's um, it's an avenue that's a bit, would be available for Benasra and Frege to go down that would um, would both solve the Benasra problem and also get Frege not to um, just reject those, uh, this this the contextual kind. So as soon as you distinguish between defining an expression and individuating the entity that the expression is meant to pick out. Um, what Frege says in the passage about I haven't settled where it's due. See, he also says some other things too. He also um, says it doesn't settle issues about uniqueness. It doesn't settle whether N is identical with M for arbitrary natural numbers. But that's not right on the, on the view that um, numbers are individuated by their, their application conditions. So there's application conditions that will determine whether 13 is identical with 12 or not. And it isn't because they're different, yeah. different conditions. But if they um, had the same application conditions, then yeah, that's right. Has the same application conditions, the same number. Yeah, right. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I do think that's a way of integrating epistemology, metaphysics, and the theory of understanding as well. Yeah. For natural numbers, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And of course, there's there's still a lot more to to explore there, but um, seems at least a, as you say, a, a a possible avenue to to go down, even if it. Um, it's not quite clear how how it will turn out. Yeah, so, walk down there and see if we need to turn back again. <laughs> see the right. right. Um, and another thing you talk about, um, I think, in the primacy of metaphysics is you mentioned the um, theories and, and and talk about time and as well as the self. And I was wondering, um, what sort of views have you come to, maybe in light of some of your thoughts about metaphysics here about the self? Is this something you can say about? identity over time, identity in these like 
um, you know, cases of fission infusion and what's going on? Do you think that there's stuff to draw there or? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, originally, I, um, I hadn't ever intended to write a book like The Mirror of the World, the one that's about the, the first person and ways of thinking and the nature of the subjects that you think about when you think about yourself in the first person way. Um, but I got so interested in that special case of relation between um, uh, the metaphysics and epistemology that I did write that up. Um, so in the, yeah, so I think it, it became really important to distinguish between ways of thinking of subjects and subjects themselves. And this is important for, for multiple reasons, not, not least because um, there are lots of organisms you can conceive of and probably many actual organisms in the world um, that are, are subjects of experience, um, but don't have even the primitive form of the first person. You, it's very, very clear what a system of representations like that would be. You have that there's certain kinds of events, objects in relation to a here and a now. You could even update a map of the world and, uh, with a here and a now, but it doesn't, doesn't need to be um, predications of the first person, it doesn't need to be timeless and so on. And it's a in, really interesting question, what more needs to be added um, for somebody to be um, not just a subject, but to be, be self, self-representing. So what that means, one of the things that means, it's, it's not to be denied that those creatures um, um, are subjects of consciousness. There's a subject there. It's just that they're not referred to in the first, um, in their own thought and representations in the first person way. And so I tried to give an account of, um, of those subjects of experience independently of their ability to, any ability to exercise the first person concept. And I came to the idea that, well, two crucial things, I think. One, one is that there has to be an integrating apparatus. Identity of subject over time depends on the um, persistence of an integrating apparatus, integrates uh, various perceptual, other somatic, various other states. The other thing that occurred to me when thinking about this, and this was something which I, I hope I improved my view from um, uh, 20 years ago, um, uh, there's always been good arguments, I think, that for any conscious uh, mental states, it must have a subject. And this isn't just a linguistic point, because you can't make sense of the idea it's being a, a conscious state, except in terms of um, it's there being something it's like for the subject of that state. That's the classical intuitive Nagelian uh, Tom Nagel characterization of a conscious state. And it, it involves um, not just that it seems to be a subject, it involves there really being a subject for which um, there's um, something it's like being in that state. Um, that's okay, but it doesn't, it doesn't accommodate um, unconscious experiences. Um, you, you can't, uh, un, sorry, unconscious uh, mental representations. Um, and un, especially it does not accommodate unconscious perceptual states. There's, there's not a lot of difficulty, I think, in the idea of being um, rather primitive organisms that have perceptual states that are not, not conscious states, but they're still perceptions. And uh, is there an argument though that unconscious perceptions have to be um, states of a subject? And I think there is an argument. That's something that occurred to me um, after I, uh, I wrote the material in um, Being Known. Um, and the argument is that um, there's no giving an account of what it is for a perception to have a certain representation or content for it to represent the world as being a certain way. Um, except in terms of its uh, explanatory powers for the subject of that perception. It's, it's whole, the whole significance of seeing something in a certain, perceiving something being a certain distance and direction. It has explanatory significance for the future actions of the subject of that state. There must be a subject that so you can't give a good account of what it is to have representation of content, even unconscious content, except in terms of um, its significance for the subject of that state. So the principle that um, a mental representational states, perceptual states at least, have to have subject applies not only in the conscious case, but in the, in the unconscious case as well. Um, then you have, so suppose, um, this is you know, it's not a solution to the hard problem consciousness or anything like that, but it, it, it gives you an, an account of the kind of um, uh, network of relations and the idea of a subject uh, with an integrating apparatus um, to whose states um, applications of the first person concept must be, um, must be related. So you, uh, you, you anchor a grasp of the first person, even if it's a very primitive thing, and it's, um, 
<clears throat> in what states of this more primitive subject um, make reasonable first person judgments. Um, so if there's something a certain distance of direction there and perception represents that as being the case, <clears throat> then you can there's the judge that there's such and such a thing in that relation to me. The, the, you can build the some kind of the me thing. I'm, I'm, and um, uh, so that's the way I proceed. That's a very, um, yeah, it's a very primitive notion of um, self-representation. Um, it doesn't involve all kinds of things like um, uh, reflective self-consciousness or interpersonal self-consciousness. Those are all more sophisticated things that need to be characterized, but I think they're all built upon and they all need to um, be explained in terms of or have links to this more primitive kind of first person um, content, which itself is individuated and anchored in its relations to properties of subjects of experience, but not, not related to the first person concept at all. That's one of the cases in which there's a real, real big sharp difference between um, the meaning first view and um, the metaphysics involving view, because some of the uh, meaning first views have been developed for the first person and they, um, they you try to get a conceptual office, but you actually look in detail what people give. Um, it's tied to various perceptual experiences, which um, people conceive of as having first person content and they perceptual experiences do have first person content, but I think they have that first person content in virtue of relation to a much more primitive thing, which involves the identity of a subject over time with an integrating apparatus. So this is very, very much opposed to so-called narrative conceptions of the self. I mean, the phrase narrative conception of the self can cover a multitude of things. I mean, obviously we do have narratives about ourselves and we do have certain self conceptions, um, but that, that is not what makes us subjects of experience. The notion of being a subject is a much more primitive thing that grasp of the first person is tied to. And the grasp of the first person that's tied to those more primitive states of a subject um, is, not, is not a narrative notion. It's not individuated by narrative at all. It's individuated by these more primitive states of, um, organisms that can make first person um, representations reasonable. Yeah, um, you've given a lot um, to think about there, but I think some of what you were saying about how there's a sort of like integration um, mechanism or something going on, um, that seems kind of plausible, might seem to um, something like that, or maybe some other things can explain how. Um, since there's this like ongoing process that this is the same organism or same self over time. Um, is that part of how you? Yeah, you know, I think identity that? of subject is tied to identity of integrating apparatus. Um, an integrating apparatus can, can, in principle, could fission could apply and fusion could apply. So this is not something that, that, that rules that out. Um, right. Fair enough. And um, so I wanted to move on to kind of talking about some things to do with mind and perception. And I wanted to talk about some of your other work on related to uh, uh, musical experience and um, uh, the distinctive character of that. So um, I found that pretty uh, interesting discussion. So one thing you said, you said was that um, Musical experience involves experiencing something metaphorically, like as something else. Um, and uh, yeah, that seemed pretty compelling to me. I mean, like for example, that um, when we think about or have certain musical experiences, sometimes we think about um, and experience that thing like as melancholy or something like that. And that's sort of a metaphorical way of describing um, the thing. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how um, the sort of metaf metaphorical experience um, occurs or what sort of account uh, you're providing here? Yeah, okay, good. So um, I don't think this is the only way of experiencing um, music. I think sometimes you experience music as similar to expressive action. You can experience something as a, as a sigh or even experiences laughter in some cases. Um, uh, but a lot of, um, uh, some parts of music, you, you're clearly meant to hear them as similar to expressive, expressive action. Um, but for a huge range, you're not. And um, there's a lot of, uh, melancholy is a good example. There's, um, 
there's no particular bodily expression of melancholy that will distinguish it from other states with low with low affect. Melancholy is a very specific thing has to do with you know, um, the past being better and things like that. Um, so yeah, so um, we asked what kind of uh, account is this? So there's um, first of all, there's just the account, uh, which is hard enough in itself, um, of getting the phenomenology right, specifying the right phenomenology. You hear certain features of the music metaphorically as so and so. Um, in some cases, it's not at all difficult. So the um, uh, uh, Schubert has the capacity as a composer to make just some tiny little movement in a piano accompaniment make sound uh, sound like the lapping of the water at the front of a boat. Indeed, he can make it sound as if the lapping is changing and changing. Um, so there, you hear the lapping metaphorically. At, you hear the the notes metaphorically as the lapping of water. That's just a description of it. There's other cases where you know Debussy can make you hear certain things as metaphorically as the rising of water around the sunken cathedral or um, the wind blowing things on the plain. Um, you can also, it's also very important it's, um, uh, that you can hear um, modalities of, conscious modalities of action in music. You can hear um, music as a struggle. You can hear in features of the music as determination to overcome struggle. You can hear weakness in the music. There's all kinds of things. In all of these cases, there's certain specifiable features of the music here metaphorically as, as something else. Um, that's just the first step. That's just describing the phenomenology. That's actually just getting the datum, the datum right. That's itself hard enough in some cases. Um, but then it raises gazillion questions. Um, uh, whenever there's metaphor, there's isomorphism. Um, but of course, you don't know that isomorphism. You just hear this metaphorically as that. Um, so in some sense, um, some subpersonal psychology in you is exploiting an isomorphism. Um, and it's a really great question. Um, what's going on in the mind brain when that's the case? Um, this is actually a point at which I would connect some of this quite surprisingly with some of my stuff on, on magnitudes. Certain magnitudes in the brain must map um, metaphorically. Must, there must be an isomorphism between those representations and representations of the thing that it's heard metaphorically as, states of melancholy or the lapping of the water on the boat. Um, so that sets a challenge. That sets a challenge for um, uh, computational representational psychology um, to say exactly what's, what's going on there. Um, but uh, it's also the case, I think, that this should make us reconceive our um, we can see what metaphor is. A metaphor is not fundamentally linguistic in this view. You can perceive something metaphorically as something else, um, but you can also imagine something metaphorically as something else. And um, I think um, there's just a huge range of states that involve the capacity to um, represent one thing metaphorically as something else. And uh, I think we have metaphor in language simply just as an expression of that. <laughs> those, mental, those mental states. So this is a mental state first view of metaphor, not, um, not a language first view. Um, but this still leaves a gazillion questions open. So you may say, well, you know, human beings are capable of being in these sexual states with um, experience one thing, or something else. What's, what's the point of that? What's the interest of it? And so one of the things that one has to do in the phenomenology of music is to um, say a lot about what's going on as you hear a musical work proceed. Um, in some cases, I think as a musical work proceeds, you, um, you build up a conception of a mental life and it's heard in the music. Um, uh, and I think you can use this apparatus. I think you build up a certain kind of mental file um, of, of what a, um, of a, a certain kind of life that's heard in the music. And it may not only be one life, you can hear multiple agents in music sometimes. Um, I also think that um, I, I didn't distinguish, like I, I eventually want to write a book on music if time, energy, and university regulations permit. <laughs> I, I want to write up a book length um, uh, treatment of these issues. Um, I've distinguished two kinds of content so far. There's kind of where something's similar to expressive action and the case in which you hear one feature metaphorically as something else. Um, but I think there's a third kind of thing that music can do for us, which is a very, very important um, and it, you know, what can pose aim to achieve as well. Um, so if you take something like um, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, um, uh, 
that that is meant to you're meant to experience terror at the inhuman forces of nature that are controlling in the visual it was a ballet but it's supposed to hear this in the music um but you do not hear terror in the music there is such a thing as experiencing terror in the music hearing certain features of the music metaphorically as experience of terror um in fact that's what you get in the music for um the shower scene in hitchcock's psycho bernard herman as a way of um the, the, this music for that um you hear metaphorically as as terror the terror of course meant to be experienced by the woman in the shower gets stabbed um but the rite of spring um you don't experience um the music um as terror from the inside but you do have a a reaction to it there's certain things as reactive content you you um if you understand the music properly you you find it terrifying you find these are terrifying forces of nature um being expressed here um and i use that distinction in a lot of other cases so one of the things that's going on when you hear a piece of music and some build up mental representation of it over time there's not only the contents of the first two kind there's reactive content as well and sometimes that reactive content um can be overwhelming um, and it's certainly meant to be the case in music that's either political but especially music of religious significance i think that's very important so um you certainly um, and you don't need to be religious to appreciate this if you um you listen to Bach's and matthew passion and you understand the text um you will hear certain expressions as expressions of grief and suffering you hear choruses expressing certain attitudes to these events that have occurred um but you're meant yourself to have a certain human reaction to these um these terrible and unjust events that are taking place um and um, one of the interesting things about music is um uh what it can do and what it can do legitimately and what it can do illegitimately so in, this is you know it's in the in a good cause you don't have to be um, religious to appreciate this was unjust suffering that's being represented in somatic passion um but the you know the music like any other art form can be abused the um and whether it's you know the underlying message in the political use of music is can be um uh, is really right is is a further thing so there are there are artists in other art forms um uh, who abuse the powers of the art so i mean Lady Riefenstahl is a classic example you, you, the opening session scenes of the triumph of the will anyone can see it on youtube it's a, it, um you know it's fantastic the, the playing coming through the clouds you see all these people marching into some great event then what it turns out well it turns out to be a nuremberg rally which is terrible right um so this is actually something that goes right back to um it was the passages in St. Augustine on the perception of music are absolutely brilliant. It just, when you read some parts of Augustine, you, you think, God, this man has a terrific mind. It's just, just fabulous. It's something you feel with other great philosophers, especially in Augustine on music. So he starts talking about um, how the music, you know, enhances his wondrous um, appreciation of the powers of God and his humility and this and that. And then he thinks, thinks hmm, yes, well, actually, it would do this even if that weren't the text you know <laughs> he's, he's right on that um so the the emotional content of music this is one of the interesting and powerful things about it it's it's fine-grained um as i said in the in the, the little piece in um which journal of aesthetics um it's fine-grained in some sense it's much more specific than particular words and that's one of the you know one of the reasons that people set words to music it um pins things down more precisely but the actual affect has has no particular intentional representation or content concerning the word and it world and so it can be abused as well as used well um uh, and of course that's true of art forms too but in case of music i think it's it's very striking um my general view um i don't want to turn to sermonizing my general view here is one of the reasons i want to write a book on this is that i think the the apparatus and resources of contemporary philosophy of mind can be put to work in explaining lots of things about music in a way that hasn't actually been done in the literature so far. I mean, maybe somebody else is going to do this or <laughs> beat me to it, but I think there's, there's a huge amount of apparatus and good distinctions that we use in other areas that have got application to the perception of music and the extant literature in the philosophy of music and the, in musicology, much of which is, um, especially musicology, is absolutely terrific. Um, hasn't hasn't been done and i think there's kind of opportunities for, for doing that and um so i hope to do a little little bit of it um 
it, it's it's a hard subject. It's it's a tough subject. It's a tough subject because it's it's so clear when you've got it wrong. I mean, sometimes you get if you look at we don't name names, but if you look at some literature in the philosophy of music, they they talk about um, as the music proceeds, it mirrors the emotions. And they say, you know, well, mirroring, you know, we look in the mirror, it looks exactly the same, but it isn't, it isn't the case that you actually have those emotions when you when you listen to the music. You um you stand in a very special relation to them, but it's not one of actually having those emotions. Um, so mirroring is not right. However, you know, phenomenal, however acute and sensitive a description may be about what's being mirrored. It isn't mirroring is not the right notion there. Um, so there's a lot of work to do, but I think um, I think we have some of the tools and I, I hope to do some more on that. Yeah. Yeah, great. That's a that's a great overview. And I had a couple of um, couple of follow up questions on that. Would, would you say um, take some piece that for like many people or at least some people does lead them to have this sort of um, experiences that you would describe metaphorically perhaps, or, um, or that we would think of them metaphorically. But what if there's, presumably there could be other people that could hear that same piece say, and have no such experience, or at least report it, no such experience. Would you say that they're not really having a musical experience or is that not really a requirement for having a quote unquote musical experience? So musical experience, yeah comes at many different degrees of um, different kinds of description. I mean, they may be hearing something as a, as a fifth above the tonic or whatnot, but they may not hear this as um, ironic or questioning or whatnot, or, you know, uh, as a, a sudden question of doubt or enthusiasm. Yeah, this it's, is a completely intersubjective phenomenon. I, I don't think there's a right or wrong of it. What I do think though, is that um, there's such a thing as not fully appreciating a piece of music yet. So, um, uh, sometimes you can point somebody to some passage piece of music and they say, oh, this is energetic. And they say, no, you listen more carefully. No, it's actually, it's anger. This is this anger is being expressed in this music. And that's certainly true of some, some passages in Mahler, for example. Um, this is this angry music in various ways and you don't really, haven't really understood it. So it's anger in relation to kinds of events that were being represented in a very general way earlier in the music. Um, so it's a rich phenomenology. Um, I, you know, it's 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 completely subjective. It's intersubjective, which is why. Um, so we're going to concert halls, and people will have a large measure of agreement on certain kinds of things. But the idea that there's anything here, I mean, the very characterization of the experience, hearing this metaphorically as that, you know, already completely removes it from the realm of correctness conditions. It doesn't represent as correct. It's, you know, so it may be aesthetically good in all sorts of ways. It can be profound in all sorts of ways. But um, yeah, co correctness or incorrectness is not a good notion to try to apply. Right, fair. fair. And, and also in your explanation there, you mentioned um, how the musical experience or the emotions involved can be much more fine grained or specific. Yeah, even in language, and and that's I think in the paper you talk about that as Felix Mendelssohn's point, right? Um, what do you think about the potential reply, although it might be naive, that um, if the sort of difference or um, quality is like qualitatively identifiable or distinguishable, why couldn't in principle someone assign a label to that sort um, of experience or quality? Does that make it? Uh, not more fine-grained than what can be linguistically described, or, or what do you think? Uh, you, you're absolutely right. They could, and it would be a certain kind of um, demonstrative. That that kind of melancholy, this degree of determination, that kind of weakness or hesitation, um, they could do yes. Um, but it it would um, it would be a case of what Quine called deferred ostension, right? Because you'd be getting at it via the music. What you hear in the music is a specific degree, perhaps kind of melancholy, a sp specific fierce determination to succeed, overcome um, certain kinds of struggles or obstacles. Um, this is a point to which um, one of the pieces of apparatus I would use is to um, talk about those range of concepts that involve a certain kind of acquaintance relation um, with the states that have been represented. And um, 
I would use the points that uh, were made by one of your other distinguished interviewees, Frank Jackson, when he was discussing the Mary case. Um, as, as Frank eventually came to think, I think that uh, the Mary case is not an objection to physicalism, but it does illustrate that there is a very distinctive way of thinking of the property of being read, which involves an acquaintance relation. One of the thing, um, uh, one of the points I will develop if I can get round to writing this monograph of music is to emphasize that um, the modes of presentation of the concepts, the modes of presentation under which emotions are given to you when you listen to a piece of music are Jacksonian. They're Jacksonian in the sense they're given to you in a way that involves the ability to recognize. There's a connection between the recognitional ability and um, what, you, what you hear in the music. Um, uh, in this respect, um, hearing something in the music is similar to a, a memory image of an emotion. If you have a memory of an emotion, that's more spe much specific. It's a way of lashing onto it, even though you may not be having the emotion itself, the memory is uh, the, um, So memory and imagination and musical experience on a par in this respect. They can give you an acquaintance with a fine-grained type without you actually instantiating that type. And I think the, the Jacksonian character of the modes of presentation under which you hear emotions and music is, is an er resource, and it's an explanatory resource to explain a lot of phenomena about, about music. That's, that's the program I've set myself to uh, in, in writing up uh, um, some of this material. Um, it immediately gives you a, a limited kind of um, ineffability. I mean, of course, you can't say that degree of melancholy um, in non-demonstrative um, sense, of course, perhaps somebody's got a theory of degrees of melancholy, but it would be a substantive informative thesis that uh, this is melancholy of such and such kind. Um, so the acquaintance relation is crucial and concepts tied to acquaintance, I think are crucial in explaining how it is that various mental states are given to you in, in perceiving, perceiving music. Right, and, um, and maybe to put this another way, I think you say in the in the paper that you think you can, or someone can refer demonstrably at least to a mood or emotion, like metaphorically present in a piece of music, without having had ever, um, or even then having that emotion, or at least that variant of that emotion. Um, is that, that's right. That's what you would. You would I say? believe. I believe that's the case. Yes, I think, and I think you could. Could. Um, give example actually um yeah um so yeah um so it's it shouldn't really be described as giving a recognition of capacity it's not recognition of um this is entirely analogous to um uh mary in in frank jackson's room that if, if you could really give her um uh, an imagining or an apparent memory of redness um then uh, it wouldn't be news what red things look like when she goes out of the goes out of the room. Um, so yeah, all, all of those things can um, can uh, memory, imagination, the way that uh, these mental states are given in music uh, can give you an acquaintance with a fine grained type, even if you haven't actually encountered that type before. Hmm, I'd have to I have to think about that some more because like. I know when I was when I was thinking about this, like um, I was thinking, okay, we um, develop associations between various um, experiences and sorts of experiences with various other um, uh, emotions and other things, um, and this could be whether we're talking about musical experiences and and emotions of sadness or whatever, or whatever else, or happiness or playfulness, or whatever. And um, I don't know, I was thinking that if you hadn't developed any of those associations already, when you have a particular musical experience, it's almost like, at least for you, there's no fact of the matter which um, emotion it is that you're, you're perceiving, because you haven't sort of generated the associations required to perceive it in that way, if that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I think I think you're onto something there. I do think um, in the cases in which I would say you can um, experience a new emotion or a new action modality in, in music, um, 
there must be some explanation of, of how and why you do that. Um, and so the new emotion must be something of a certain kind. It must involve perhaps very negative or positive affect. It must have certain connection. So I think I think that's true. Um, but I don't think it means that does, I don't think that means you must have experienced that particular emotion. So extreme joy that you can hear. And um, let let's take um, uh, I know the, the last movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony um, thing that Wagner says the apotheosis of the dance. You, you can hear this extreme expression of, of joy and enthusiasm or never anything like then you may say well you know still something of the same kind that you had before right and i think something like that something like that is that is right um, um these issues are very complex because as i said before part of what happens when you listen to music work is you, you build up this huge conception of a, of a mental world from the inside and that may involve all kinds of novel complexities and things that you've never um, never encountered before. So the resources that a composer has um, don't just include how you hear this at this particular moment on this particular occasion. It's um, this particular moment, this particular occasion is part of a much, much bigger structure that will uh, affect how you how you how you um, interpret and place the particular emotion you hear in that time. And that that too may involve new um, new cognitive structures you haven't. Um, experienced before, thought back before. So there's a lot, yeah, a, um, the composer has a lot to play with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fair. I, I think, like I was thinking about another uh, sort of hypothetical, because like you can imagine a piece of music or something else and um, you have one person and because of the um, their psychology or the associations they formed or whatever complex facts we think are involved here in perceiving music yeah. in a certain way, um, they perceive a particular piece as melancholy and another person, because, you know, they have a different psychology or whatever, the same piece, they perceive that as playful. Um, I, certainly that's something possible, right? I think it is. I mean, that's a very extreme case, melancholy versus right. playful. I, I, I could imagine, I could imagine fleshing out a case like that. I mean, particularly, for example, if the um, if the theme that the first person hears is melancholy, is actually a variation on some kind of traditional style, but it's done in a kind of naughty way, right? Then um, uh, and Tom Adams could do that. I'm sure he could write something right away if, if he wanted to. Um, yeah. So it, it yes, it, it could be done. Um, I um, I'm sure. I think also there are also cases where. Um, uh, certain kinds of piano concerto, where you get a certain kind of dialogue between the, uh, the piano part and the orchestra, especially in Mozart, piano concertos and slow movements. Um, sometimes you listen carefully and listen to the way of the themes, you can actually hear the pianist as, as questioning something at a certain point. And sometimes you hear this question is resolved in a certain way. Um, as if it's been the relaxation of tension that the question is been um, settled how this should be resolved, where this should go. Um, so yeah, it's 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 very it's very rich, and people can hear hear different things. There. I think there's also a question also not just, I mean, it's not just like going into a museum and being or um, something like the old San Francisco Exploratorium and being struck by lots of visual illusions. There's also um, not just as if you're parading these different ways of hearing things in the music. Um, there's a question of doing it well, you know, doing it well, or the, the um, whether the the mental world that's been built up when you hear the music is one that's worth worth developing in various ways, psychologically interesting. I mean, a huge number of dimensions of assessment then come in into the music as well, as as they would with visual arts or any other art form. But I do think the basic resource of hearing something metaphorically as something else that's that's what you need of form to build everything else up, up from. Yeah, for sure. And I, I guess with this sort of example, though, I was thinking, now suppose we had another person who themselves has never experienced or developed the concept of melancholy or playfulness. And um, I mean, would it then be possible for them to experience it as melancholy? I mean, what would decide that that's the way they experienced it? Do you know? You know what I'm getting at? 
Yeah, well, I would actually distinguish between experiencing melancholy and having the concept of melancholy. Mm. I mean, that's, no. you know, you can have the first without without the second. And um, uh, and it's the first that you hear in the music, I think. it's you, It doesn't need to be conceptualized as such. It's that, you know, that, that complex sad state that also involves feeling that things were better before and so on. That's, um, it doesn't need to be categorized as a melancholy for it to be experienced as melancholy, I think. Yeah. Or I should say yeah. metaphorically as. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, all right, and I had another question. So I think you mentioned this, uh, something about this in passing already, but um, do you think these sort of features are um, present in the same way in other domains, like in perhaps other experiences of visual art or um, other phenomena? I think you can, um, yeah. You, you, uh, I think in the 2009 paper in the British Journal of Aesthetics, I, I talked about these paintings by Zubaran that have four pots. And you you experience them as as people. <laughs> you experience them as it doesn't. It's not as if they look as if there's people in the picture. You actually need the notion of experiencing one thing metaphorically as that. And then um, uh, you know, there's the famous romantic painting of of the lonely tree. You know, that's sort of distorted and not in the sunlight. And there's other trees that are close to another in the sunlight, and they're not and they're growing properly. And again, you don't. It doesn't look as if that tree is a person in the picture, but you experience it metaphorically as a lonely person. Um, uh, uh, so, so yes, absolutely. And um, you, it can be in pure literary forms as well. So um, the famous Thomas Mann story where this talks about this, this clown and you go on reading as how this clown is influencing the people in the audience and then you suddenly realize metaphorically as um, Hitler in relation to um, a German establishment in the, um, late twenties and early thirties. Uh, so, so yes, I think, as I said earlier, I think this idea of representing one thing metaphorically as something else, it's not it's not restricted to the musical case at all. It can occur in in thought, it can occur in fiction, it can occur in the perception of pictures. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be. Do you, do you think there's like a this general account of that that would kind of explain what's going on differently in these different cases of different with different perceptual faculties in play or um well I think there have to be a certain common form I mean in every right. case as I said there's an isomorphism and the somehow the isomorphism is exploited in visual perception or in thought or whatnot, but without being able to formulate you know if you ask you know what in virtue of what do you um experience this clan metaphorically as Hitler in relation to the German political establishment um well, you'd have to think about it, yeah, but you, you know, it all comes later than, <laughs> than I'm appreciating the, the metaphor, yeah. And this is certainly the same in the musical case. It's also the case, um, I think, you know, people sometimes talk about um, the relations between music and poetry. And I think in poetry, there's very special features um, where you experience certain things metaphorically as something else. So the, the line structure, the line breaks, the um, the uh, the repetition in the syntax, the prosody, um, you hear certain features of that metaphorically as something else, and a great poet can can make use of that prosody in certain ways. Um, uh, and you you get that in in Dante, you get it in T. S. Eliot, um, uh, and so um, people sometimes say music and poetry are on a spectrum, but I think in this respect of um, exploiting certain features of the prosody or certain pieces of music metaphorically as something else. It's actually the same structure, but in one case applied to pitch perception or rhythm perception, and the other case applied to features of prosody or the dying breaks or whatnot, yeah. So there's, yeah, there's more to be said about um, experiencing metaphorically as in various art forms and in, in literature and in poetry too, yeah. All right, very good. I don't, um... This has been excellent. I don't think I want to keep you all day. So okay, um, no, you need a break. I'm, as I said, I until I actually keel over, I was, this gets me doing this stuff. So anyway, I, it's a very enjoyable I, conversation. Thank you. Well, yeah, sounds that's right. not a problem. I did I did want to ask like sort of one question as in uh, to wrap up that I I like to ask uh, the guests on the channel, which is, um, what would you say is the some of the 
best value of philosophy? What is what is philosophy good for, and, and why is it worth doing? At least at least for you. I mean, in so as a question about me, I just want understanding. <laughs> I just want to understand these relations between perception, thought, the world, justification, and some of these things absolutely do have application. They, they have application in issues about grasp of concepts, they have applications in developmental psychology, they have applications um, uh, in, in moral philosophy, legal philosophy, but if, if you ask me, um, are those applications the reasons you do it? No. <laughs> Any more than a pure mathematician is working on his or her problems because they might have applications in relative theory or whatnot. Um, I, I, I just, I want understanding, yeah. Yeah, that's, I really like that way of putting it as well. It's like, um, I mean, you might care about these other things and you might care about doing philosophy for their application to these other things. But um, for a lot of people, um, really it's about, it's about understanding things, about figuring things out. You know, it's about the problems. Yeah, no, I bet that's true for many of your interviewees. I think I'm idiosyncratic. I think, I think so as well. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's a great place to end off. I saw Thanks again, Professor Peacock, for, for being here and taking my questions and providing some uh, very excellent thoughts and responses on this. It's been, it's been great having you. Thank you. It was fun. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Bye.